the shooting of the product. Yes. How do you get not do whatever you want? He comes to do this too. That's why we walk out. Also, exactly what we have in here, which is that um, it can be uh, used to get people to uh, engage in this kind of competition, which might not be so good. So if I was linking this to original thought, I might decide that I want to link that to say how um, Amazon Mechanical Turk works. So I can say that actually you're a Turk and you're working um, uh, sort of uh, in the, on Amazon Mechanical Turk. You're likely to want to conclude as many tasks as possible really quickly to get the right cash. And that means that there might not be very well, you might not be well completed. In fact, um, about half of the mark, if you're creating a mechanical Turk task, about half of the actual mechanical Turk answers that you get back you have to discount because they're very It's just only picking one more one at a time to get, get to the task master. So that's the important thing. Um, how could you include social or group dynamics into a system? Badges, badging systems, so you can uh, uh, want to get more badges, that's true, yeah, okay. Um, how can I have some users' perception of fun? How can I have some users' perception of fun? So you have rewards, yeah? So you can have the and then that's the users for second. But what are the kind of things? What were we looking at in chronology last week? Yeah. Let people personalize stuff. Let people personalize stuff. Or if you're a system developer, you might want to personalize it for a group of people who might be interested in the idea of the machines that are copied. Like the handwriting uh, application that wants you to put down the cocktail and make a cocktail while you're doing it. Like Dropbox, which says, oh, this is going to take some time to synchronize, so let's go and put on it on Snickers. Okay? It's also marketing, so that's true. Okay. What is the skeptic view of gamification? The skeptic view of gamification. Yeah, the big, the big man, is what we used to say, the, the man is trying to get you to uh, kind of manipulate you because that's what they want to get to do, want you to do what they want you to do. Yeah. Now that's a skeptic view, it's just a, uh, well, who well, wants to elaborate a bit more on that skeptic view? Yeah. So what, is, what, what one of the points we see is talking about is that um, really it's about um, business managers <coughs> Wanting to really make their make their really tedious business applications seem more cool. Which is one of the two tick marks that I want to use. Okay, principles. So we have a number of principles. The 
suggest you look at those principles and you know, actually go back and um, look in your notes and basically find a principle you can describe and find a number of principles. So okay, so what we all came with um, last week's topic. We all kind of get it. This semester, um, or this, this semester, but it wasn't before this Monday, um, because we're having um, a Barkins lecture uh, afterwards, and they're going to also talk about sort of fluid that kind of thing, the dragon system, so she's going to put them together. Okay? So that's why we're skipping ahead for that one. So this one is with more we head now, so this, this one is a little bit of designing your evaluation. So if you remember in the kind of great life cycle of this course and of what you're doing, and indeed in the life cycle that we saw in from ThoughtWorks, we've got this bit with, where we're collecting information, then we're iterating the design, we're iterating development, we're sucking more information and refining it, and then we need to test it. Okay. So we need to test it at the end. So how do we do that testing? Well, we do it via evaluation. Well, before we do it by evaluation, um, we need to think about how we do this evaluation and why we do it. So, first of all, who knows anything about samples, scientific method? Who's read STEM in the Art of Motorcycle Methods? Yes! You all, gosh. See, I should have, I should have gamified STEM in the Art of Motorcycle Methods by promising stickers or cocktails to the first person to read it. That's the that's what should be. Cool, well done. Well done. Anybody else? Nobody else? No, no, no. I thought you were a creamer, nerves of. It's fun! It's a fun book, it's not. Yeah. Hang on. Okay, so, anybody want to tell me anything about science? In the system. Okay. What problems do we have with evaluation in the US? What's the general what? What characterizes the US? Yeah, subjectivity. subjectivity. So we've got this idea of um, sort of the old HCI quantity in the new UX design quality, and those are smushed together, and so therefore we get problems with subjectivity. So we need to think about subjectivity in the evaluations. Why is subjectivity a problem? So why is that a problem for your system, for your evaluation? It's difficult to measure, that's true enough. So why does measurement, why, why do we care about measurement for evaluation? Okay, so it might be good for your person, but really bad for the others. So where are we going with this? That's true, but what are we trying to get to? Trying to get something that's called generalizability. Okay. And trying to make the work actually more generalizable to the population. So we're trying to get to a generalizable, we're trying to get to the evaluation of generalizable. So therefore we can say our product, our interface, our interaction is good for everybody, or the majority of people, not just for a person, not just for me. Okay. If it was for me, and I've designed it just myself. What is it called? What do I call it if I've designed it myself? Yeah. Autobiographical design. Okay, so if I've designed it just myself, I can call it this autobiographical design. So, if we've got, so the, the evaluation that you're going to perform is really, really complex, but also really important. If you have a badly designed evaluation for your 
tools in your work, then you're going to get incorrect analysis, incorrect results, incorrect results, you get incorrect, and then your analysis is going to be incorrect. And incorrect analysis means you're going to get incorrect conclusions. So, if I'm talking about this, what kind of value designs, um, you've seen this already in the first lecture, what kind of value design that gave us incorrect analysis that gave us an incorrect conclusion? First or second lecture. New Coke. Do you remember New Coke? Everybody said, in the time taste testing, we love New Coke, we love New Coke, and when they uh, released New Coke, nobody bought it because they really hated New Coke. Yeah. That was a badly designed evaluation, leading to an incorrect analysis, leading to an incorrect conclusion. Even though, the experimenters obviously wanted, and Coke wanted the answer to be new code is good. You know what they wanted, they wanted the answer to be new code is good. And because they wanted a specific answer, that's what they were biased towards. And in all their designs, they biased their designs even imperceptibly because they wanted a positive answer that new code was good. And you can have all of the evaluation you want, and you can want everything is good. But the reality is that when it's then released into the real world, out of the experimental framework, it isn't good. Okay. okay. The success of the intervention is in doubt. So therefore, whatever you do, if you do it badly, it's in doubt. So everything hangs on this. Everything you've done now, up to yet, hangs on this. Okay. So, Evaluation is not on track in the previous 200% of the papers of course it has been to a large experiment and makes them crap. Okay, the point is, everything you've learned about collecting information, collecting requirements, solicitation, changing those requirements, analysing those requirements, moving them into a format for which software engineers can understand, then helping the software to understand the principles of design, from the evaluation for their countries, their experience, and so on. Have all been junk. Because your evaluation, which is the real gold standard of whether what you've done is correct, whether each of these stages have been correctly applied, is a junk. So it needs to be a good evaluation, that's why it's so important. Okay, so in science, we care about generalization. Why do we care about generalization? People are subjective, okay? And we want to be, we want to think about generalizable um, results so that we can apply it not just to an individual person, but so we can apply it, apply it to a population of people. Um, who's done statistical analysis? Who do the statistical analysis? Do you know the difference between a population and a, and a sample? Do you know the difference between a Parameter and the statistic. No? Okay, well, in general, we define our population, but the population is too big. And so we draw a sample of that population, and then we can perform on that sample a statistical analysis. In a population, if you test everybody in the population, then you get a parameter, and, that popular, and that's always correct. There's no, you can't be not, because you've correctly tested everybody, you've evaluated every single person. The whole point of statistics is so that you don't have to, you don't have to evaluate everybody, and so therefore you, you need some concept of generalizability, so you can generalize it to the population. So for instance, in your course evaluation questionnaires, the people who fill those in online are the sample of the entire population of this course. So the population of the course might be 110 people, the sample might be 30 people. And what the university says is, these 30 people are a representation of how all the others who didn't create the population, didn't, didn't form part of the sample, how they felt about the course. So it's generalizable. Well, obviously that's not the case. 
uh, things that need to take into account because people are feeling quite generic and self selected. So that means the right to match the right, the right to hate, of course, the other things. So, of reasoning that go along with this. And so the first type of reasoning is inductive reasoning, which evaluates and multiplies to the general population, as we just said. Okay? And that happens in fact in lots of scientific work. Um, abstractions are observations of individual instances of members of the same population. Okay? So generally, your members of the same population, I might just ask this one table, who is a sample? Do you understand that? What's the thing? Do you understand that? Yeah? Okay. Okay. There's also another thing called deductive reasoning. And deductive reasoning happens often in closed world situations. Yeah? So in closed world situations, we, can, we have a set of principles which say things like herbivores only eat my pattern. And then we say all vegetables contain only marketing. All cows are herbivores. Therefore, vegetables are a suitable food for your cows. And this is a deductive reason. Okay. We start with a set of principles, we start with a set of statements which we think are correct. And these often work in what's called closed world situations, theoretical closed world situations, and then it's usually used to apply it. So this can be applied in computer science in certain areas of logic because it's a closed world. It's not the real world, it's not the real world. The, con the conclusion must be true provided that the premises are true. So the premise is true, then the conclusion must be true. The problem is this when you get the premise wrong. So when the premise is wrong, then it will break wrong. Who's done um, description logic? Anybody done anything to do with semantics? Description logic? Structured data? So, if you didn't get, okay. So, you get this in that, in that about description logic. Okay. Are we clear about this? Do we know now what populations are about, what samples are about, what generalizability is about? In that kind of way, we would like to induce the reason to do it. Are you comfortable? Or am I just talking about it? Yeah. Okay. I'll take silence to be in acceptance. Okay? Okay. So, to be scientific, a method of inquiry must be based on the gathering of observable, empirical, and measurable evidence on the subject of specific principles or reasoning. That's what you've got, that's what you're trying to do. So in general, when you're trying to build um, an evaluation, you must conform to science, good science, to good scientific method. How many of you have done courses on the philosophy of science? Anybody who knows anything about science, even though you're computer scientists, nobody ever told you anything about science. Can science go anywhere? Do you anything to do with science? Do you want degrees? Do you want anything to do with science? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I Yes. In fact, um, repeatable, testable, the testability criteria, the fact that the criteria are absolutely um, necessary. We must be able to refute those uh, things. And actually, up until 1956, when Popper, Karl Popper, added the testability principle, that wasn't the case. And that's why now, science changes, changes for the law. This kind of, this kind of science changes for the something whereby you try to prove something to the way by you try to disprove something. So you need to be used to test it. If you can disprove it only once by testing, it must have a condition of testability, then we know that it can be it's not proven. But you can support as much positive cases on it. You can't do only one. So that's why it's that's why it's got to be um, that's 
as well, it's got to be about supporting a hypothesis as opposed to disproving a hypothesis. You can't prove one in no way. You can't prove one in no way. Okay, so here we have the general idea of the scientific method. Now, now if you were into scientific method, you know that this is a very simple thing. We've got this, we're looking at some other kind of um, ways of doing this um, next week. But there's lots of other there's, um, lots of other there's, there's, um, there's a thing called grounded theory. Has anybody heard of grounded theory? No? In which the, in which the um, hypotheses arise from the data as opposed to the start of the hypothesis. Okay, okay, well, we'll get to that. So first of all, the idea is we have these hypotheses. Does anybody want to tell me what hypotheses might be? Give me an example of a hypothesis. Somebody is using in their third year project to do your evaluation, which you hope they Yeah? You're claiming something. So it's like a claim, claiming something, and what characteristic of that claim needs to exist? Now, that can make predictions, but what characteristic of the claim needs to exist? It needs to be testable, it needs to be refutable. So therefore, a hypothesis which is not strong enough to be testable isn't worth it. The hypothesis needs to be very strong but very brittle. Okay? So it needs to be a strong claim but easily broken. Yeah. It's not easily broken, or you don't have a, a clause that allows you to easily break it, then you can, it's, you can easily Suggest yourself that, well, it's not been broken really. The claim still stands, even when it doesn't. So if you get the best science, it needs to be brittle. Okay, you can say something about testing that you've done in your evaluation. Anybody? Oh dear, I need some to do that for first. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to do? What's the other for the same day? What's the other day? Okay, one, two, three. It's not what would be known because it's also a closed world because you it's closed. So, um, so a lot of people would be, well, is that really you know, how to talk about well, well, I think it's not what it is. Code's method, code's method then. Yeah. Um, I was depending on uh, what the properties of the idea. So how do you plan to test that? So it's, it's, it's um, so I can replicate your testing. Yes, I'm going to do it. So it's all about the things. So I might be the first one to do it. I'm going 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 to do it. I'm going
it's about, it's about supporters of the team as opposed to the team. Yeah. Because the team could be could have a different focus than yeah. the supporters of the team. Yeah. Okay, you're right, yeah. As long as you make sure that's explicitly stated, because otherwise you're saying that this thing is a proxy logic of another thing. And this thing, but this thing to things Okay, so we have our hypothesis. We create and enact some experiments on those hypotheses. We get some data back and we do some analysis and get some conclusions, get some findings. So actually, in your work, in your project work, uh, in your uh, write-ups, then this, this hopefully in your evaluation section is what's going to be when we're doing something like this one. Who's not planning on doing an evaluation for your of some right in your projects, those are your projects? You're all doing evaluation. Yeah? Okay, good, good. In your first CV to do evaluation, you usually do one as well, you could do as well. Um, who's doing evaluations with people? One, two, three, four, okay, people. So, have you guys got your ethical approval for experimentation with human participants? Which is a requirement of your field. No? Yes. Oh, yes. Some people, but some people not. Okay. Well, you should go onto the ethics system, it's very clear things what they're doing. And it also tells you what method you ought to be using. So you should get your ethical approval. You don't have your ethical approval, theoretically, it's if your supervisor has not told you to get ethical approval, then your liability has to be your supervisor. Supervisors told you to get to the people that you haven't, you are liable. So if anything goes wrong, you will be seen, not, not the supervisor or the university. Okay? Alright, we're going to get on to our fix after the break actually. Okay, right. So, anybody has, anybody has heard of the famous book, Black Swans? Black Swan? Anybody heard of Black Swans Black Swans? Anyone heard of the Black Swan hypothesis? No. Yes. Oh, tell me that. Tell me. That. Right, I'll ask so we have all the swans. If all the swans that you see are white, um, conclude that every swan is white. But if you see one swan that's black, you can conclude that it's not white. That's right. Yes. Yes, we need to say the same. Yeah. Sorry. It's so exactly that. So, where this comes from is that. In the old days, uh, 1500s, the uh, well, explorers were out there and they, uh, everywhere they went, in every country they got to, in every country in the UK, they pillaged and conquered. They went to battle. We found swans, and swans were found, all different types of swans, and they were all white. And so the hypothesis was that all swans were white. The swan was white. In fact, in my head, when I think about it, I always visualise the swan as being white. If I assume it's a little swan, boom, it's a picture of a white swan. However, um, when the West discovered, if you like, or Northern Europe discovered Australia, we found that there, there existed no white swans, but white swans. And so therefore, the hypothesis is disproved. So that's how we work in, in scientific, uh, in scientific method. We have a strong hypothesis. It doesn't say most swans are white. Some swans are white. How can we break that? Okay. It's difficult to break that. Some swans are white, most swans are white. What we say is, all swans are white. We only need one case to disprove it, but even in that, when we say, what we want to remember is that for, in, the, in Northern Europe, anyway, it was understood since well, for millennia that swans were white. Okay? That was a truth, if you like. So what you've got to think is that you can, all, you can say that all swans are white, 
and still didn't be able to break that. But to say all songs are right, maybe that's a problem. Because you can see that in Australia, they're black. Yeah, but think about maybe like the day so when you see all songs are right, they can be painted and more Quite a lot, because the reality is that you want to say all songs are right as opposed to most of them. Most songs are right isn't a scientific testable theory, so therefore you're not a scientist if you say that. So screw that. That's it. Um, if you're saying this as a, um, it, but if you say all songs are right, uh, you have, the good thing about saying it is that in science we learn far more about being dis about disproving something than we do about really trying to support it. If you look in particle physics, the people, the tests that were created to try and find the Higgs boson, they weren't there to find the Higgs boson. They were there to disprove that it existed. And by the fact that they couldn't disprove that it existed, then they were going to say, well, it doesn't raise it. But all of the actual work in, or well, not all of it, the vast majority of work in lots of uh, empirical disciplines isn't about supporting something or trying to uh, prove it or trying to prove it. It's about trying to, trying to disprove it, to break the hypothesis, to break the hypothesis that often the theoretical. They create a hypothesis, and empiricists try to break that. And the more they can't break it, the more they feel secure about that it's, it's true. But it might not be true. Okay? Um, so that's, that's, that's the thing with white and white swans. Now we could say that, at the moment we say all swans are, um, well, all swans are either white or black. Okay. All swans are either white or black. All swans? Everywhere? Or are we saying all swans on the planet Earth? What's our domain of reference? You might believe there might be another planet, you never know, with this kind of swan on it. I don't know, I have no idea. Okay, which might be, uh, you know, bright purple. I have no idea. But what you also need to do is frame your statements. So, so we're saying all swans are white, all swans are white. What it actually means is all things being equal in the domain that we know all swans are right. Okay. Yes, you might want to be We always know you know to be able to. So you can't a lot of that you can't you can't do it and say all this is all the thing. That's right. You can't say most. No. So that's the word. Yeah. So would you need to say something primary? Good point. We're going to get to that in a minute, so it's good. Yeah. Yes. Come. So, statistical methods, there are two types of statistical methods. What are those types? Do you know? Any idea? So, there's Fisherian and there's Bayesian. Okay. The one that most people use, that's, that's been popular for a long time, is Fisherian statistics. Okay. 
And this is often based on a thing called, well, it's based on confidence. So it's based on confidence. And there's a number that comes out of most statistical methods, which is a p value, it's called. Okay? And the p value is normally set to confidence of 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 based on how confident you want something to be. You want that a specific statistic. Okay, we're not going to get into statistics. Uh, there's a whole thing on them, but they're getting so annoyed that they're going to have a heart attack before they get into it. Okay, so what we do is we often take the standard, it's called an alpha value, the standard alpha value which we set before an experiment to 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. You can vary that, and you should vary that. But for Sheridan statistics, all this is based on this idea of p value. And p value is always directly related to the number of participants, so n. In the UX, we always have low participants. Okay? Because we have low participants, you can never be that confident. If we're super confident, we get a very good confidence interval on our statistical analysis, and it means that we can, with just a low number of participants, it means that we can be super confident about what we're getting back. However, you might miss a result in the noise. Okay, and that's just what happens. There's no really good there. Okay. If anybody's too hot, they can switch these things off by the way. Okay, so these statistical methods allow us to say that we are confident to a certain level that our hypothesis is correct. And that there was not disputed by the way. Um, and that it can be extrapolated, if you like, to a general population. So that's where we can, with your answer to your question, which is, it's not 100% that's true. It's, you have to make a strong statement from your statistics to have confidence level to decide on how confident you are about whether your hypothesis holds is true. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? Does that make sense to everybody else? Yeah? Yes? Uh, I'm a good boy. So how small? Uh, that's a question. That's a question. Uh, if it's too small, uh, do you think it is a distance? Okay, so what's too small? Let's be scientific. Yeah, less than 30. Less than 30. Why do you say less than 30? Because it's like the number when you're using um, like a huge number. If you ask 30, you can use certain uh, tools for statistics. So, you can use tools for certain statistics if you ask 30. The reality is that the reason why we talk about 30 on statistical analysis is because we know that 30 oftentimes, not always actually, but oftentimes, forms what's called a standard distribution. So do you know what a standard distribution looks like? It's like a, a binary. Yeah? yeah? It's like so you've got so it's just like a little wave. You know, it's standard distribution, right? So because when you've got 30 data points, they often take a standard distribution, not always. Mostly you need 30 data points with the number of participants in each data point. But let's say 30. And that's called parametric statistical analysis. But there are tests which allow you to do, do non-parametric statistical analysis when you've got a low number of people and where you um, don't have a standard distribution because it's too few. Now, what you've got to think to yourself is that is that statistic really valid? True. I don't think it necessarily is valid. So but what it does is it gives you an indication of truthfulness, correctness. Now you can mess around with that because you can do a couple of things uh, in statistical analysis. So the first thing that you can do is, if you want to mess around with the data, is that you can create, you can have a different alpha level. We were talking about the alpha value being an indicator of how confident you are in something. But it's also directly related to n, to the number of participants. If you've got a low number of participants, set your alpha value to 0 0.08, say, and see what p value you get. Well, that means your p value will be set to 0 0.08, and see whether you get a confidence uh, level of 0 0.08 as opposed to 0 0.05. 0 0.05 is selected for maybe psychology where they can get 100 people, 0 0.01, social science where they're getting 20,000. However, you are. Um, 
Medical trials never go with anything less than what? 10 to 20,000 people? Because they need to be super confident. Uh, you're going to do a deadly drug, I kill you, you need to be pretty confident. The other way to do it is a thing called bootstrapping. Have you heard of bootstrapping? So there's a thing called bootstrapping, it's called sampling with replacement. So if you've only got 20 people or 15 people, you take one out if you like in your bowl. You take a person out, you go, yeah, this is their data, and you throw them back in. And you keep doing that. So you get the same people repeating. You can do that for a thousand times, ten thousand times to get your standard distribution. Uh, and strangely, mathematically, you get reasonable results from it. Okay, so something like that was a little aside. Um, what we're trying to get from this external validity. So we've got two things. We've got internal validity, which works on, on descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics are things that you all probably know. Who's heard of mode? Who's heard of mode? Only, you, only if you've got the maths, then there's four of them, five of them that have heard of mode. Anybody heard of mean? Or average? The upper quartile, the lower quartile. Yeah? Okay? Standard, okay. Anybody? Um, uh, standard deviation? Yes. Standard error? Okay? Good. So all these things are to describe a sample. The internal validity of a sample. The internal cohesion of a sample. Okay? So if you have a sample and you've got 20 people in that sample, and those 20 people are giving you similar responses because we've tested it using something like um, so if we test it with mean why why are we testing it with the mean or the average might cause a problem outliers tend to skew it quite a bit so therefore we might want to use mode but if we are using mean then we what we want to use is a standard deviation to see what the actual difference from the mean to these outliers are, right? So that way we can see how cohesive that sample is. That gives us internal validity. We then use, um, we then use different kinds of statistics. So statistics that allow us to discuss causation and correlation, things like ANOVA, things like um, the man Whitney U. Basically, okay, these kinds of statistics allow us to understand um, uh, correlation. Now, correlation does not imply causation. Okay? Correlation just says these two things are related to correlation in some way. But we don't know whether one is affect, affects the other. And at this point, we then go on to what's called regression analysis. The most modern one at the moment is called the general linear model. Regression analysis, which allows you to understand uh, causation, whether like one thing causes the other. Okay? So that's how we do. That's how we get to certain things. And that's how we do external validity. There's a number of tools that allow you to do this quite straightforwardly. You have to know how to apply them. But the one that most social scientists, psychologists use is SPSS. The one that um, the one that's free is called PSPP, it's an open source version. And there's also R, so has anybody heard of R? Okay, well, R's a good one to use, so R is a statistical language that you can then integrate into Python and then you can have a But all these, the, the, descriptive in, the descriptive stats talk about internal cohesion, internal validity, but what we're looking for is external validity, when you're doing this work. How can you your data to the population. You can't test everybody. So that's what external validity is about. In empirical work, nothing is 100% certain. So if we're looking at 0.05, we're 95% certain. If we're looking at 0.01, we're 99% certain. But we're never 100% certain. The different kind of errors in statistical analysis, I'm not going to get into them now. Might be called type one and type two errors, okay, which allow you to understand 
whether you've missed something, you missed a signal in the data that's really happening, and you're saying it's not, or you misinterpreted a signal in the data, it's not happening, and you think it is. Type one errors is that there's something happening, you misinterpreted the type two errors are that you missed something. You missed something. And that's what we use alpha and beta values to control. Okay. So, there are a number of variables that we need to use in our um, data gathering, in our, in our um, evaluations. Behavioral, equated to the user. Okay, so what kind of behavioral data? We've got stimulus, equated to the actual machinery that you're creating. An observable response. Okay, what happens? Okay, so, you might say that the behavior is equated to the user, so it might be equated to you. I might equate it a little response to you. And now I might say, what's the stimulus? And I might go like that, and then you go look at me and look at you, and you can do that. That would be an observable response. Okay? That's what we would be doing now. In the talk, in the form of computer science, we obviously say that the behavior is the user, so you've got the user. The stimulus is a user interface, an interaction. And the observable response is what happens. Time to task. Okay, task completion time, that might be the Okay. Subject. This, I'm the subject here. You won't catch me using it very often. The subject is just, I'm just using it because I want you to know that in the old days we called users subjects. Because they were low users. Because we were uh, experimenters, obviously. We were scientists. Now we call them participants because they're at the same level. Calling people subjects meant that it gave experimenters this kind of bizarre idea, empiricists this idea that they're better and so therefore it's new results. Okay, because subjects knew that they were subjects and therefore wanted to do what the experimenter, the empiricists wanted them to do. Okay, independent variable is the thing we manipulate. Dependent variable is the thing that we measure. Okay. So, so the good psychology, do they understand independent and dependent variables? Have you heard of these before? We have the interval scale, we know it's identity magnitude and also is in equal intervals. And the ratio scale, which has a true zero in it. It's got the same equal as the rest, but it's got a true zero in So, of these, do you understand what that means? So, who wants to give me an example of nominal? An example of nominal in your, as a variable, might be yes, no, maybe. something like one on a on a on a uh, on a on a um, questionnaire one two three four five sometimes you see these questionnaires that say very pleased very displeased and then there's a set of numbers that you know, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah? and so that would be all there's a big punch up in statistics, like nominal and normal scales in which is appropriate to use in the data. There's more tests and more solidity in ordinal, so we all like ordinal, but a lot of people say that actually it's nominal because this ordinal thing is really equal really to that. Okay? That becomes confidence about nominal. So all of these are based on confidence. You can be very confident, you can be less confident in that than you can in this. Actually, it's, so you put in one, two, three, four, five, it's as a benefit of equal intervals. So I would suggest that in one, two, three, that's, that's one of the big uh, discussions. One, two, three, four, five, it seems like it's equal intervals, but do the intervals matter? 
Put 1, 1.2, 1.6, 1.10. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's just a category of it's just a bucket. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a bucket one. And it's more scale actually exactly is that. You can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, where you know that each interval is exactly um, interval is exactly an interval. So the way it's actually is, if you're looking at an interval scale, can you times it? I can't times categories, and then theoretically I can't time it all of these. Because it doesn't make any sense. Because okay. there's no because if because there's a you know the identity of magnitude, but because there's no equal interval, you can't do that. So therefore, in the interval scale, you can times it. Okay, then the ratio scale option zero. Okay. Measure it on the bottom of the experimental angles and kind of answers that the possible of data has been collected. So you need to decide what analysis you're doing before you decide how you're going to collect the data. Okay. We have two different kinds of testing. Well, we have one kind of uh, hypothesis, actually, two different kinds of uh, uh, one kind of one, one type of hypothesis testing. So we have the normal hypothesis, which dictates that there's no difference between two conditions beyond chance. Okay. Beyond random chance. The other one dictates that there is a difference um, and supports the hypothesis proposed. So when people say, well, I'm testing the normal hypothesis, they're saying, actually, it's because I think there's no difference between these two. Okay. This was shown to be testable. Nothing is ever proved. My friends are going to this group and not ever proved. So we're going to see a bit more about this on process test in a bit. So a 10-minute break, come back at it. Uh, eight minutes past. Any questions on statistical analysis? Ask me now. I'm going to switch some of the seats off because it's pretty boring.